Hola, Yanka. ¿Aló? ¿Me oyes? Lali, tú sabes manejar esto, que no lo logro. ¿Cómo hago para oír? Lali, porfa, me ayudan. Me traen mis audífonos corriendo. Están en mi, en mi cajón. Por favor. Y trata de leer algo, de, 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 de correr algo, porque te oigo muy mal. Te oigo como entrecortado. Voy a ponerme los audífonos. Si me das un segundo, voy por ellos. Parece que están como a 20 metros en la finca. Un segundito, ¿bueno? Listo.
¿Aló? ¿Aló? ¿Me oyes mejor? Sí, ahí te oigo mejor. Perfecto, te espero a ti. Me vuelvo a poner acá. Listo. Yo te veo. Estás en tu pantalla, ¿no? Sí. Ahí ves a okay. eh, Prisa, Elgin y Giancarlo. Ahí estamos los cuatro ya conectados. Perfecto. Wonderful. All right. I am ready. You can, ¿Tú me puedes decir cuando yo comience a leer? Saludamos, me imagino. Mira, yo, yo saludo. Mira, yo saludo, Yanka. Yo, yo lo que voy a hacer Ajá. es... Buenos días a todos los que están conectados a este doceavo conversatorio de Arquitectura 2020, evento realizado por Construcciones Planificadas. Les recordamos todas las preguntas. La presentación de hoy se hará en inglés. La haremos en inglés. To present our, our today guest, we have invited architect Giancarlo Masanti, who have write some word to present his friend. And to present okay. the architect yeah. of the matter and light. Y ahí comienzas con tu discurso, o sea, no, no le echemos más a y no, good afternoon, ahí comienzas. Ok. Listo, tú pero... Tú me dices, ya, Carlos, ¿estás ready? ¿Alguna cosa así? Uh, no, I said, uh, and, and to present the architect of matter and light, y ahí empezas. Que es el título de tu... The architect de, of matter and light. Que es tu arquitecto, okay. tu título okay. arquitecto. Perfecto. Ok, listo. Listo. Está funcionando bien. Yo lo hice por el teléfono porque el teléfono funciona mejor la conexión. Bueno. Listo. Eh, perfecto. Okay. Ahí está Steven. There we are. Can you hear us well? Hello, everyone. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Hello, Steve. Hello. How are you? Very good, very good. Thank okay. you for this uh, opportunity. No, thank you to you for your time and to be here. I am very excited to have this uh, talk with you. Uh, we have invited uh, a friend, uh, one, one friend of you that is called Giancarlo Masanti. Yes, of course. The great, the greatest Hi. living. Hi, Hi Steven. How are you? Very good. Yeah. Hello, yeah. how are you? All right, perfectly. Good. Where are you now? In your in the country? Yeah, there are, we have an archive building here in Rhinebeck. So uh, that's uh, the, all yeah. my shelves of all my models are here. So I've been working here since March, working from uh, Rhinebeck. Wonderful. Yeah, here. I am, I am in the country, in the farmer too. It's wonderful. <laughs> Giancarlo is going. Giancarlo Steve is going to give you the introduction. He have uh, write some words, beautiful words, words yeah. to you to introduce you. <laughs> So he is going to he he is going to 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 read some words that he have write for you, and in that moment we we make the introduction for your for your presentation, and after we t we finish your presentation we begin a sex a session of uh, quest uh, question and answer about architecture. Okay, good. So let me rename here because it says my name instead of Stevens. One moment. Okay. I'm glad it Erin, Erin, if you want to see how it's going to be shown in the in, in live, you can see the the YouTube uh, link that uh, I sent. Uh, Molly. Yes, great. Yes, I'll be. I'll, I'll do that. I'm going to send it to to Monica, so that she send it to you. I have it. I have it. Yes. Okay, the YouTube. That's the way that is going to be the, uh, seen by all the people. They are, right, yeah. they are not going to see us like we are seeing now. To, to, uh, in yes. that they are going yeah. to... So in one minute we begin. In, we're ready. They don't see my face like this. 
It's a pleasure to see you, Stephen. I hope to see you the next time in New York. Bye bye. I go to yeah. to read your 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 introduction. Do you want to be recentered? Your camera is right here, so when you look at the presentation, you're going to see your progress straight on. All right. But you might want to be recentered a little bit. This uh, light is coming from this crazy. It's a very weird light. <laughs> well. <laughs> Listo, Chavi, ya listos. Estamos listos. Ok. ¿Cuánto termina? ¿Cuánto se demora, sabes? Ok. So we are going to wait two minutes that they are in live in another program. So they're going to pass to our program. Okay. And then I'm going to run these, am I going to run these slides from this? Yes, arrow forward and backward. Okay. It's not working yet. How about now? There. Okay. Yes. And All right. Now see. I can't go backwards, huh? Okay. There. All right. And you see there is a video in, on the 12th slide. It says play video. And then we do it automatically. And then there That's is the hard it. part is yeah. playing the video. I, I be right here. Can, can, can people yeah. see my face? No, or just the I'm, screen. I'm checking to see what they can see now. Yeah. Uh, they, Steve, they are going to see you only when we begin the, the presentation of uh, the question and answer. But in the presentation, they are only going to see your, your presentation and the videos. All right, fine. Okay. Buenos días a todos los que están conectados a este doceavo conversatorio de Arquitectura 2020, evento realizado por Construcciones Planificadas, la W Radio y por el respaldo del Grupo Aval. Les recordamos a todos los que todos los conversatorios eh, que hemos tenido anteriormente los pueden ver en la página de www.wradio.com.co slash arquitectur o en la página de www.construccionesplanificadas.com slash arquitectura. Este es un evento totalmente gratuito y la idea es que los conversatorios puedan ser consultados por cualquier persona. La presentación de hoy la haremos en inglés. To present our today guest, we have invited architect Giancarlo Masanti, who have write some words to present his friend and to present the architect of matter and light. Giancarlo. Buenas tardes para todos. Good afternoon to everyone. It is my pleasure and an honor to introduce you to a good friend of mine and one of the great American architects of the 21st century, a master well known of his generosity and enthusiasm towards architectural life itself. It is difficult to detach architect's work from his personality, and in Steve Ho Stephen Hall's case, it is more difficult. Those for uh, Uh, who have who have had the privilege of sharing his enthusiasm with teaching together at Columbia University, or have had the change of of begin in his cozy studio surrounded by drawings and watercolor paintings, can give a uh, fate or hold oh, his okay. amazing work and personality is up. Okay. 
are absolutely symbiotic and inseparable. Uh, his architecture in its architectural in its stem is generous and human. To these thin features is Stephen Hall's daily life, which may also be uh, appreciated in his choice of, of work partners such a Chris my boy. I could mention Stephen Hall architect Ellis Price and multiple projects, but I rather explain his work from his love and passion for the drawing and his own articular manner of thinking. Drawings is his way of understanding the world. His water paintings are not only representation of, of what may became of building. They are ideas which summarize his philosophy and his understanding of the way of building humanity. His architectural world and his drawings are in itself a way of thinking. This makes the visit of his studio in New York is a fascinating experience that offers a whole new dimension to a particular way of understanding the world. Every inch of if you work in this space is covered by drawings on, on water paintings, each of which is full of concept, metaphor, place, new material, geometrics, and color. His work is a permanent research and continual discovery by means of which an infinite number of windows open up to us for our delight and learning. His work is characterized by his deep respect to knowledge of the settings where they are going to the place. Each project is a completely different drawing. His buildings are unique for they are conceived to belong to specific place, weather and culture. His architecture is not only beautiful game of the, of the under sunlight, his relationship with art and metaphorical construction, his project makes them each of them singular. The wonder about and explore his building is a well sensorial and special experience by which the major protagonist becomes of the movements created of soul life. The Stephen Hall architecture seems to be alive, the way in which the sunlight details around us through the material usage reflects and creates shadows and fascinating translucent effect, given the sensations of inner life. The behavior of the light appears of the fear in the up the structure compressed emerges in an expensive, the material is fully malleable and he's at the service of the phenomenological and atmospheric architecture, allowing for it to transform the world and his people into something better and for acquiring a social impact and meaning. His conviction that architecture can transform the world and peace life really is an optimist for a better world. The architecture is natural and optimistic achievement. I now leave to you a great architect above all with a great example of enthusiasm and generosity. Thank you. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Giancarlo. I, I love your uh, uh, introduction. In fact, we posted it on my website. It's so uh, laudatory. And thanks to Construcciones Planificadas to sponsor this. And I was told also, maybe listening would be Geraldo Milan Cuervo, the university head of planning, and Jorge Bula, and, and, and Ricardo Daza, and Diego Suarez, and hopefully our, our associate architect, uh, is getting ready to, to build something here. We, we, I decided today to make a more simple presentation and not speak about my theories. I mean, I have this new book, Compression, which uh, it's a, a, a book that's in a series of five, and uh, we, can, we can maybe talk about it afterwards in the questions and answer section. So with just seven projects, I'm going to end uh, our, our last project will be the doctorate building for the National University of Columbia. So I'm starting with the with the, the REACH, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, which opened in this fall. And you, you can see here my diagram for the competition. This was an architectural competition uh, against, uh, you know, uh, Diller Scafidio, Richard Meyer, Raphael Vignoli, many architects. And we, we, we had the feeling of the importance this is a very different uh, kind of memorial because the, the Center for Performing Arts is a living memorial. And you see the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial, very different thing. It's alive and it's, it's this idea of, 
of activating a landscape that I had in the competition. And actually, this is a drawing much later that I had to move the river pavilion up on ground. Um, but the, the, it's about the same size, by the way, as our doctorate building in, 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 in Bogota design. And in fact, it was designed only a year afterwards. And it was just opened after seven years uh, of, of work. And you can see the relation of the landscape and the different pavilions. Everything is connected below. So these are, these are like tips of an iceberg. Um, the entire program of, of the, the rehearsal rooms that was part of the competition all exists below this landscape. There's me kissing the white concrete because it took the contractor several months to get a proper finish and texture on the concrete, which finally arrived. And there you see the relation there. You see in the distance, the Lincoln Memorial. So by the way, in Washington, D.C., there are not very many pieces of modern architecture and uh, certainly not in, in, the, in the name of, of, of um, presidential memorials. So I think it's really a very important work, a very, a very public work. And the language here is white concrete and, and it, with some, uh, let's say, orientation and spatial compression and expansion. This curve has to do with the fact that 90% of the building is below the ground. So the, like a glissando in a musical instrument, like when you run the bow, the, the bow over a violin, all the notes are played in glissando. And that's that kind of curve that goes underground and connecting everything to the below grade. There's of course the uh, donor wall, very important in America as we have no public monies and David Rubenstein uh, is the main donor here. When I presented the competition, he said, afterwards he said, and I presented it to a kind of 20 trustees, he said, I'm giving $50 million to this project because I love the architecture. There's our auditorium, which is a kind of crinkled concrete. These are the bearing walls that hold up the landscape above. And we devised, um, in fact, that's in the video, isn't it? The, the story of this, I'll leave that to the video. And there's the simulcast, very important to me because it costs $200 or 250 or 300 a seat to see the opera. But here, the opera is simulcast to the public for free. So this is like a, a real social uh, statement of, of access to the arts. And this pool is the same size as the pool that we have at our doctorate building. I'll show at the end of the, these projects. And here's a little video. Can we play it? What do I have to do? In my lifetime, Kennedy was one of the great heroes, a great president who cared about culture and the arts. And I believe we need young people to understand what he said and what he did. So right from the beginning, we wanted to make something positive because that's going to live on to the next generation. Where we're standing now, seven years ago, was a bus parking lot and a service area, and yet it's the front of the Kennedy Center. So when we started the competition, we thought, what's the highest aspiration? Like the Jefferson and the Lincoln Memorials that you can see from here, it's a presidential memorial, but it's also the National Performing Arts Center. So that's a unique hybrid, a memorial and a performing arts center, and we wanted to take full advantage of that. And we saw here something much more than the brief, which was to add a pavilion onto the existing terrace. We saw the chance to extend the memorial for Kennedy, where the original building is a massive block isolated from its surrounding. We wanted three pavilions in a landscape making space that's open to the city, open to the river. So with these pavilions, the space between them is as important as the shapes of the pavilions.
building should be more when you go in it than when you look at it. So this project, the phenomenological feelings that you get of texture, of light, of the spaces changing dimension, in compression and release. It's like listening to a piece of music, but you're doing it with your body, with the visceral feelings that you get through a space. The structure in this building is the space and the space is the structure. The bones are the walls that you see. There's an interest in being honest to the material in which you're building with and not hiding it. When you knock on drywall, it's hollow. This is solid. And typically acoustical treatments are applied onto structural walls where we want to expose the natural material and embed the acoustical treatment into that cast and place structure. And so crinkle concrete came out of a playful experimentation about how to create a random texture with a three inch deep relief to diffuse the sound and mitigate the flutter echo. The original building is cut off from the city. There's a whole series of highways on the one side there's no connection to the riverfront on the other side. So we saw our project as a chance to change that. We have a connection to the bike path along Memorial Bridge. We have a new pedestrian bridge over the parkway that connects to the riverfront, which connects the Kennedy Center to Georgetown to the north and the Lincoln Memorial for the first time. So the whole space become much more porous and the public is invited to walk through the landscape 24 hours a day. This is a living memorial. It's very different than all the other memorials. Not only are these spaces all active, but the landscape is another dimension. It's alive. This is like trying to put a musical composition together. Each thing is playing on the other thing, but when, when they all come together, it's fantastic. Washington, D.C., there's a kind of formality to the architecture and to the urbanism that is, in a way, representing many of the principles of the government. But what you don't have so much is a kind of organic connection to nature and a kind of organic space. And that's what we are aiming at here. This is a different kind of space. It's a curvilinear space. It's organic space. It meanders. You meander through it. So the landscape and the way you're experiencing it is very different than the frontality and the monumentality of most space in D.C. Dick Kennedy's work was really amazing because he had statements about the stewardship of the environment back in the 60s in a way that now we know it's an urgent issue. And this building is an example of as green and ecological as you can make it. Our most basic common link is that we all inhabit the small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. JFK. Okay. I'd also like to present a, an equally important project that took us around eight years um, is the Lewis Arts Complex at Princeton University. Basically, this is the entrance to the Ivy League campus of Princeton University. And, and uh, it's a complex of three buildings. And we originally uh, 
In fact, Renzo Piano had designed a single building uh, for this site and was rejected. And uh, we proposed to divide it into three and connect it with a forum below, a water garden. And each piece has its own idea. The three things are connected with the forum, but then in, in the dance building, you have the idea of a thing within a thing. So the different dance studios are different materials within the stone cylinder. In the poetry and literature section, things are embedded. And in the music building, individual practice rooms are suspended over the collective practice room. And there you see the plan where the large forum, by the way, that was not in the program. Uh, I like to add things that people don't ask for. And uh, it's like Lou Kahn said, what's a program? It's just so many bananas, you know? It's, it's the whole way that a building works that's important. And when, when they criticized the addition of the 8,000 square feet for the forum that connected the three buildings below, the, the vice president said, it's too big. And I said, no, 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 it's too small. Anyway, we won the battle and uh, it got realized. And it's one of the great places. Everyone's, it's a very big open space and people can sit uh, on the different sofas and be on their computers. Here's the, comp the model of the project. Everything that's in concrete in this model was she it was the structural concrete of the building and sheathed in Lecce stone, 21 million year old Lecce stone quarried in Lecce, Italy. There you see the music building where the individual practice rooms are suspended on steel rods to make acoustic separation. And uh, the beams run in the, in, the, in the long direction of the building instead of the short direction. And there's a stair to the dance studios with Lacan notation and in the detailing. This was a great client that allowed us to do all the furniture, detailing, light fixtures, and everything in it. And here's a little video. I like to use these videos because I think they, it's difficult to show a space and light on slides. So at least you have a hint of how these buildings feel. That's why I put these two videos in. This is another video. This was a vision by Shirley Tillman and her committee to bring the arts to the forefront of the campus. We all know in the Renaissance, all the arts were together, right? We've forgotten that today. So the idea to bring this Center for the Arts forward and have everyone encounter dance, encounter theater, encounter poetry, encounter music, this is a very important gesture that has a larger philosophical goal over the whole idea of education. Arts are integral to our role as humans, as learners, as becoming empathetic, as becoming social activists, as becoming creative thinkers. And, you know, I knew the spaces were going to be gorgeous, but I didn't realize what it would feel like walking off the dinky and having this monument to the arts. We knew we wanted to present a new front door for the university and for the arts at Princeton. And so the project started with understanding the courtyard typology that makes up the Princeton campus, which is a three-sided courtyard that opens to the landscape and shaped by a series of portals. And we wanted to transform that into a 21st century expression of that. And so you'll see the building is able to be approached and porous from many different directions. And you're actually able to catch glimpses into the arts and into the programs. So you get these wonderful invitation views to increase the visibility to the arts and sort of allow for chance encounters with the arts. So the three buildings that make up the quadrangle each have their own separate idea. For the dance and theater building, the concept is a thing within a thing. This building, which is dedicated to the arts, is about embedded. And the music building, the concept is suspension. The three buildings are all sheathed in Lecce stone. So there's a coherence to the whole, but inside each one is different. They have their special identity within. In the music building, I had this impulse in the first sketch. I said, let's just separate the chambers completely and suspend them individually so there's no vibration transferred through the floors and there's no acoustic vibration transferred through the practice chambers. And there's a psychological separation you feel like you're in your own cabin in the sky. 
and the fact that you can see through the whole building here. You can feel this embrace of the distant horizon. I think there's something concentrated that happens in these rooms. Maybe it's because when you when you arrive here on these suspended walkways, it gives you that levitation feeling. And the way this building is structured is counterintuitive. Instead of going the short dimension, the beams go this way so that these practice rooms can hang on the structure. That meant these two facades saw just a glass skin, and that's also suspended on cables. And here you have the, the cables that are in very big tension to support this whole curtain wall. So this tension is just pulling down. This tension is pulling up, which I think is like stringed instruments that are in tension. There's a tectonic relationships to musical instruments. This building, which is dedicated to the arts, is about embedded. This stone tower, which connects on an axis to the campus, is embedded in this glass, which holds the gallery. One of the things about having this idea that drives the design is you can work your details in each of the three buildings. You have these different things that happen because that was the conceptual strategy of the building. And the stone is from a 2,000 year old quarry that the Romans opened in Lecce, Italy. And one of the things that I find really exciting today is the ability to make very sculptural and crafted elements in architecture be a direct connection from our computers in our office to the cutting machine. You can get this level of detail like medieval crafts detail, but it's done with technology. This is a room which is made out of this highly insulated glass. It's called Okalux. It's like polar bear hair. This gives us a super insulation quality and it has this cloud-like light. And the dancers that were up there, they said, oh, it's so beautiful. It's like standing in the clouds. You can see here the liquid light coming from a skylight under 10 inches of water, so it dances with the sunlight and the refraction, and it has a different feeling all through the day, all through the seasons, and whether or not the wind is blowing. So we're really connected to nature above. With the Forum, we have a black box theater, a dance theater, and an orchestra space all on the same floor and just right across from one another. That can provoke a lot more collaboration, which is the most important thing about being an artist is by communicating. Even the forum itself can be considered to be a performance space. I think that's kind of like the brilliance of it all. And it also opens to the community because there's the door to the campus right there. This is a place where people from the community can come in and mingle with people from the campus. And over there, there might be someone from the orchestra. And there might be dance rehearsal people over here. There might be some black box people over here. And there might be some engineers that just are passing through here to get a coffee. And that's what this is all about, is bringing people together. Okay, Steve. Agrupamos en 10 los retos que tendrá el presidente Iván Duque para los próximos. Okay, I'd also like to present our Hunters Point Library in Queens, which also just opened in the fall, in September. And it's a tiny building. Uh, but you can see it's in this area where there's a lot of new residential condominiums and we have a kind of uh, companion in the Pepsi-Cola sign that was restored on the left there. And this is a community library. And so we were very excited to be asked to design this. The site was large enough to make the building as a one-story building. And uh, Jimmy Van Brenner, one of the congressmen, and all of us felt it should be a vertical building. So it has views of Manhattan. And then we could leave the site mostly as a park, as public space. So this idea of a vertical building, then I had the idea of the, the circulation actually inscribing itself in the face of the building. And you could see the views of Manhattan as you move up in the different levels. And there would be books on one side and computer desks on the other. So in a way, it's a it's a diagram of the digital and the book in some kind of a struggle for, for the future of a library. There you see, actually, I think this is just after the opening, you see the condominium towers uh, um, uh, and then the building itself 
small building, just a rectangle, but the way the cuts of the circulation, you see the children's library cut on the, on the left, on the right, and the main circulation cut on the left. And the way the entire section opens up on the inside, so it has a tremendous feeling of space when you walk inside. That's a concrete building, uh, uh, just silver coated, uh, and the insulations on the inside with, uh, with plywood, bamboo plywood, ecological bamboo plywood. And there you are up in the children's library, you see the Empire State Building. The, 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 the United Nations Plaza is across from this building. That's another view of the children's library. This is bamboo, um, super sustainable ecological material. And that's another view inside the children's library. And at night, it glows uh, like a little beacon on a rainy night in November at five o'clock. Uh, uh, 30,000 people visited this building the first month it was open. So we were criticized because strollers had to be parked outside, and et cetera. But who would know that so many people would want to visit a community library? There you see the view from the approach side. And you can see that the, the, the children's library in the upper left, the main uh, adult room and the teenager's room. There's three uh, uh, social groups that are served and that's the three cuts and that's the entrance on the park side. You see the Empire State Building in the distance. The tiny building, but it has a presence. An equally small building. We just are finishing now, which should open in, a, in about a month and a half due, due to the COVID uh, crisis, it was slowed down, and, and, uh, but now this construction has resumed. It should open in October. And it's the, the arts building for Franklin and Marshall College, a very old campus dating from the 18, 1800s. And th most of the campus buildings are historic uh, monuments preserved. And on the lower left of this screen, you see a little box that was made, insufficient space for the arts, and that's a building that we replaced. And when we replaced it, we decided the building's character would, it would somehow it would be to rise it up and put an open uh, a lobby and an open uh, gallery space, put the studios above almost like a kite, kite in the trees. And then the, the tree diameters, this campus has huge trees, like some four feet in diameter. And so the tree diameters gave the geometry the convex curves as we preserved all the trees and took radius of their diameter and that gave us the geometry of the building. And then most of the, most of the uh, painting and sculpture spaces have one curved wall and the rest of the walls are orthogonal. The wood uh, ceiling was all done by Amish, the very, very famous Lancaster, Pennsylvania uh, religious group, they all work uh, together as a community and they came and they put in these natural uh, Douglas fir boards that are the support structure on top of the steel in about two weeks. There you see one of them in their, in their bearded, <laughs> you know, they, they, they don't believe in uh, motor cars. So they drive horse and buggies still and they dress in black and black and blue shirts. But here they are working and together they came as a community and put this roof in in two weeks. It was absolutely amazing. And it's beautiful wood construction. So I was glad to connect to the region. Uh, I always feel that building is about the place and, and the site and the community and somehow to bring the material and here the labor, the type of labor as really part of the, the, the sort of meaning of making a work of architecture. And there you see that rising up and the, and the distance is, a, is, a, is we're standing on the, the park side looking back and you can see right through the building there's a the campus that will be the new arts quadrangle and now we're standing in Buchanan Park so there's a connection to the campus and the park made by the way the building is sitting on its two there's a I haven't been down there because of the COVID crisis and they sent me this photograph and I can't wait to get down there that's just ground concrete with a sealer on it. We don't have any special materials. This building is built enormously economically. The, the shapes were, were lightweight trusses, almost like a box kite. And all the tubes of structure are exposed and the wood Amish exposed. And that is just uh, 
structural glass planks that we've used before in the auditorium, uh, natural wood. And then there's a ramp that connects to the level of the campus. So as you walk, this, this is, site is a little bit depressed, uh, it goes down. So if you walk at a level height from the connection of the campus, you actually rise into the second floor where, where the main studios are. This is a building I won't present in detail. I just want to say that one of the reasons we are always staying alive and healthy as a small 40 person firm is we've had an office in Beijing for now 20 years, I guess it is. And it's amazing that, you know, to have commissions and they, they just, they don't make you go through a competition. They give you a commission. And I, this was for a health building and a cultural building. And I made these diagrams and you see on the left, the basic concept diagram that it, I, I said, it's about clocks and clouds. And the shape of the building I thought could be sort of concrete as if it was clouds. And then the two buildings would form a big public round public space with the health building on the right and the culture building on the left. And then there would be a water gardens. That's not there yet. And, and these two buildings would just be in this perforated, you know, kind of sculpted concrete. And when I made these drawings, I thought, yeah, maybe it will never be built, you know, because try to make a building like cloud shapes. It's a, bit, uh, it's a kind of a stretch and then to expose all the concrete. And, and anyway, as you can see, that was done. That drawing was done actually here where I'm sitting in Rhinebeck on the 9th of August, 2016, that concept drawing, as was this drawing, 7.30, 2016. And then the other day they send me these drawings, uh, these pictures and I couldn't believe it. It's there you see in the distance, a little mock-up that they made. And uh, it's just, you know, it's amazing. Anyway, I, I won't go into detail, just that that's one of our techniques of survival is to have amazing, you know, work in China that keeps us from uh, shrinking. That's the ramp approach from the health building to the cultural building. And this is a project, we're opening the final phase. Um, it will open, the, 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 the museum itself will open in, October, it's in Houston, and it's, it, this is the largest cultural complex building under construction in the USA at the moment. And the first phase of this was the Glassell School. And there you see a competition drawing where on the right-hand side, you see the, the main museum. This was a competition for a main museum that had to be built on a church parking lot. And therefore uh, the, the, the museum, of fine arts in Houston had to build a seven story parking garage in order to move the cars from the church, church parking lot. And that was the competition order. Design a seven story parking garage over here on the left, the sculpture garden, this is the Noguchi sculpture garden in the center of the screen. And then on the second phase, build, you know, do your museum. And I was against, uh, Snohetta and Morphosis, and they both did a seven-story parking garage and a, you know, a very sculptural building, and that was the plan. And I said, you shouldn't do that. You should not build a parking garage. What you should do is you should build a new glass cell school. Your school is only 40,000. It should be 80,000 square feet. Then you, if, you, if you tear down the original building and build a new school, you can build all the parking underground on a single level, and you can expand your sculpture garden to twice the size. And that was what they decided to do. So I was very lucky that was a competition that I could present in person and convince them their program was wrong. They shouldn't build a parking garage. They should put the parking underground. And the first thing they should do is build a school because a school is, was the heart of the first move of making a museum in Houston back in the twenties when they started. So this building had to be built very economically, and, and it was. It was all, the, all the structures exposed, that's precast planks, precast concrete walls. This is the center of an L-shaped plan, where it's a kind of forum. And, and, and this idea was that we would, 
we would take that slope of the roof getting up onto the roof and, and introduce that into the concrete support pieces that support the floors. And then every studio would have an operable window. You see those little squares, those are operable windows. So what you're looking at is the structure of the building. These are gigantic precast wall pieces that are basically the support of the slabs. And they were cast in Waco, Texas, trucked into the site and, 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 and dropped into place by cranes. Some of them weighing, I believe, 60 tons. I, I forget what the heart about the, the, I mean, nowadays you have crane power and, and lifting power that you never had before. You would never do a building like this probably 20 years ago. But there you see the master plan. I should have put that up on the screen earlier. You see the Nice van der Rohe building on, on the right. That was the only curved building. In fact, the only museum building that Nice did in America. And it's an addition to the stone building, which is just to the right of that. You see the Moneo uh, uh, addition in two, the year 2000. And then you see how we've you know, made our campus plan uh, a, a maximum campus. The, the center of the screen is, the, is on the Gucci Sculpture Garden, uh, which, which is a very important uh, space. And on the left, you see the Glacelle. That was part of my competition plan. And in the middle, that's the main object of this competition, which is the museum, a, a new Richard and Nancy Kinder, Kinder Art Museum. So for that building, I had this, this concept of clouds. The big Texas sky has this enormous feeling of blue sky and expanse. And I had the feeling that the clouds could come down in a way, pushing the roof and sculpt it. So slices of light would, would move across this, what I call a luminous canopy. And these were models done for the competition, just on our CNC machine uh, cut from acrylic. And there you see the building almost finished and how these slices of light move across. There's the Mies van der Rohe building on the left. Very important building in Houston. Um, and, and we had as an idea, instead of, we had the idea of a cold jacket, giant 30 inch tubes of glass that when the sun hits the glass, by the chimney effect, it draws the air up the wall and reduces the solar gain by 90%. And this works. So these are, these tubes are open at the bottom and open at the top. And, and they create a, 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 what's a cold jacket. And then they glow at night because the galleries glow from the inside and they bring light into the galleries at the day. And that was a, that's a computer drawing. This is a construction site shot. It's still under construction. That is an actual construction shot. And you can see the cloud effect of the sculpted ceilings is starting to take place. These are enormous galleries. We still get down into the detail. We're doing cast glass for the sconces in the arrival a part of the lobby. And we do these in our shop and we, you know, we do the models in our shop and then they get cast. There you see a night view of how these cold jacket tubes glow at night from the light of the inside. And last, this is the most important building in my talk, the doctorate building for the National University of Bogota. And as you saw in the first building, the white concrete shapes space. It isn't just a, it isn't just a let's say a conceit. And, and, and I think every, every site and every circumstance is, is, is unique. And what I was really amazed with when I first came to Bogota was the, was the, was the, was the campus, you know, the, 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 the title White Campus comes from the fact that Leopold Rother did this master plan in 1936. And what's really extraordinary, I mean, it's such an intelligent master plan with, with the, with the oval shape and the circulation moving along those lines that are the morphological lines of the campus. So this is, and I, and I was just very impressed by the buildings he built there and the way they engaged the landscape and the way that they're, 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 they have a lightness and a quality that I was trying to, we were trying to achieve in this new building. And you can see here, 
on the site plan, the way the building sits on the site, and it, can, it, it kind of reintroduces that line that, by the way, in the 70s, the, that wasn't followed. And I, I think that the new leadership there should be, you know, should be more concerned than they were in the 70s and, and, and follow this amazing, this amazing work and the legacy of this campus. That's what our building does. It kind of reintroduces the legacy of, of the thinking that made this morphologically very fascinating and unique around the world. By the way, I've worked on, I don't know, 15 university campuses, including Columbia, Princeton, MIT, I won't name them all. And I think this is a very important campus, uh, the, this plan and the way that it was done. And, and these are our concepts to, to shape the campus green space, first of all, that the building can't be an object. So many buildings today are just objects. The, 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 the architect has to make his ego make a special object. And this is something I think is uh, not so good for planning and for the understanding of what architecture should do. Shape campus green space and then link the campus access, reconnect to the roller plan. And porosity, make a gate-like space via public programs. And then there's a concept drawing I call space turned inside out, I'll show in a minute. And then material and ecological innovation. And that was a kind of drawing I thought that you know, having been there and understanding that climate that's almost 70 degrees, that most, most things can be open air, which means you could kind of think of a building as a kind of shaping itself inside out. So on the left, it, it, it's up, there's a cafe, and then it turns inside out and forms a great portal. Then there's an auditorium and then it goes down and into a water garden. And we did a lot of uh, models around what is, what is that idea of, of, of a building that in a way turns inside out and shapes this porous campus space. A lot of different models were made. And finally, we, this is an early model. Finally, we resolved into this. And then also getting the program in there correctly, all the classrooms that needed to be. But one of the things I'm thinking about, why is this important? And I want to send a letter to the president. Uh, after this lecture, is that this building could be built now as an example of post-COVID, of what you should make open air circulation, low, low buildings that don't require elevators to circulate, that people can go up and down stairs and ramps, embrace the landscape and make the landscape really integral to what it is to be a work on a campus. And that's what this building is about. And I won't, I, done, I can show it in greater detail, but it will take me an hour. So this is just to say that this is a, this is a third floor plan diagram. Um, by the way, all the working drawings are done of this building, thanks to our great local architect, who's, I believe is, he's, he's there, Diego Suarez, our associate architect is there in this talk. And there you can just see some, some model shots. We have a gigantic model, and this model will be shipped to Bogota, and there will be an exhibition. Chris told me, my, my partner Chris told me that this exhibition will be, I think Ricardo Daza is there. Maybe he can answer some questions after the talk, but I think it's going to open next year. So what I would propose is we have a groundbreaking while the exhibition is opening. That would be a nice idea. <laughs> and there's the cafe, a diagram of, of the cafe, and just some views. And this is state of the art. Uh, PV cells now can be integrated into a roof membrane. Matthias Schuler from Transolar is our consultant. So this building would be, you know, practically net zero. And we have water gardens, like I showed you in the first project, the Kennedy Center. What a, what a wonderful thing, a large shallow pool of water can be and all this and it's all the gray water and rain water is recirculated but it's all it's all powered by pvs so the, the 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 little motors that require circulation in the water is all done by the sun and there you have that grand space and now i thought also because of covid i'm thinking i want this building to be an example of how to build on campuses in the future so i said let's do this Let's take the 550 seats in the auditorium 
and let's make it a 200 seat auditorium with big space between the seats and have a simulcast, now a simulcast projection outside in the portal so everybody can be out in the landscape and also see a lecture or, 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 or an academic event. Because I, I, I really believe strongly that today more than ever where, where all these universities can't open and we need an example of a campus building that can provide distancing and space and landscape and air and open air and access that can show a future that won't be leaving us all on Zoom. I think the idea that you run a, a, a university campus on Zoom is wrong. There's too much to know, too much about the physical presence of space and light and shadow. Everything on a screen is somehow less. And uh, the, 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 the quality of the seasons, the quality of the sunlight, the quality, the smells, the wind, the, 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 the landscape, um, and this is a, a very uh, unique site. I was glad that the university allowed this site because I think it connects with this existing landscape in a very beautiful way. And as you saw in the first, the first project that we realized at the Kennedy Center, I believe this would be as important in Columbia as the Kennedy Center is in, in, in Washington, D.C. Because I think, I mean, it, it has a lot of messages about architecture, about what I believe in it, and I think it could be a, a very useful building as well. Oh, there's a little sculpture project at the end because I just finished this and installed it in Art Omai, which is only about 10 miles from here. And we were, we were experimenting in CLT, mass timber construction, which I think is very interesting. And it's the idea of a sculpture that that actually tells you when is the summer solstice, the equinox, and the sum, and, and the winter solstice. There's this concept sketch. It's a tiny little work, seven feet by eight feet. And you see the title is from my daughter, my four and a half year old daughter. She said, Obelin, Obelin. I said, Eo, what is that? She said, it's whatever you think you want it to mean. It's, and I say, okay, I'm gonna use that title for, for this sculpture. And then the experiment is that we use one sheet of CLT to make the whole sculpture. We use the seven arm uh, robotic machine and we, pl we plugged in our computer drawings and it cut it in a matter of days. And then it was, uh, it was cut and assembled on the site in pieces and, and lowered into place on three screw ankle piles. And there it is. If you come to the New York uh, Sculpture Park Art All My, you can see it and you can sit in it and smell the, the, the wonderful of that natural CLT construction and how I think material mm -hmm. and the way a building is made speaks to people in a way when they, when they go in it. And even though this is just a tiny little sculptural work, I think it has in it uh, those those, let's say, philosophical meanings that I think every architecture can get. And I think that's my last slide, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, so we're open for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve, for this inspired presentation we have today. Uh, and we are going to begin our question and answer part of this uh, talk today in architecture. Uh, 2020. Um, the first question, Steve, that we want to uh, to say to you is, uh, what what is architecture for Steve Stephen Hall? I always feel that it is the most powerful of the arts. It has the the possibility to put essence back into existence. You know, I think you you know your music uh, uh, is an analogous to architecture because it surrounds you. Sculpture you can turn away from, painting you can turn away from, but architecture is an immersive experience. It surrounds you. And I think this is very important in our time of everything being digital. I think it, it has this, this power. And you know, I, once I had to make an exhibition in, in Vienna, they said, can you just give us a simple two word explanation of what your work is about? And I said, okay, Idea and phenomena. It's about idea and phenomena. 
an idea that drives the design, okay, that's my philosophical conceit. But you don't need to know about the idea to get the phenomena. The phenomena is something that a five-year-old can understand. The light, the space, the texture, the smell, the acoustics, these are, these are the phenomena. Okay. How, how is the Stephen Hall studio? Because we have heard that you said uh, as that is 40 people in your studio. How it's, how it's the structure of your studio? Well, it's in Beijing and New York. So there are 10 of us in Beijing and the rest are in New York. And right now I'm in Rhinebeck. So right now our structure is completely on Zoom, but it's working fine. And uh, the Beijing office, because they were smart, they had good government and good uh, control. They're all back in the office and construction sites are going on. In New York, uh, we're, we're under a terrible government. We have a stupid president. I won't get into it, but uh, we are all still locked down. And, but we're working on Zoom. But the interesting thing is I work on these little watercolors and from a concept. So it hasn't really changed. I, I always do these drawings in the morning and I send them by, by my iPhone. So in a way it hasn't changed much the way I work. I, I've done a lot of my buildings here in Rhinebeck in my watercolor shack. So it, it's, a, it's a structure that an idea drives the design and then we make a lot of models and we look at them and then we have critiques in our studio and everybody makes their position known about how we can improve a, a, a work. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. What is the importance of innovation in your office? The importance of this word of innovation? Well, I think we, you know, innovation is at the, it is at the heart of having an optimistic view of the future. I think this little last sculpture I showed you is about innovation in material. You know, CLT construction is, one of the one of the lowest carbon uh, most ecological ways to make structure and form and playing around with a seven axis robot and then being able to get some feeling of craft you know one of the problems of our time and that's why we need innovation is the the, the crafts shops have disappeared because of labor laws and expense but we can still, I think, get innovation in craft, material, and detail in different ways. And so that's, I think we, we always have to work on the, on the cutting edge of what, what's possible. Okay. We, 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 had, we have heard uh, that your office, that you have an office in the US and an office in China. Um, and you, you can do this competi a competition in a, in a extreme fast way because you have like 24 hours of continuous work because you right. have the two. How is this uh, a mode of so work 24 hours? So every morning, uh, now it's every Wednesday morning, but I can have a nine o'clock Skype for Beijing and catch up. They have to stay up until 9 p.m. But what we usually do when we're in a competition is we work on a team with three or four in Beijing and then two or three here. And they send their files through when they're done. Um, and we arrive in the office at 9.30 and receive the files that have been improved all night. So basically, yes, when you're in a tight four week design, uh, you can actually do, you can do the work in half the time because you can move the files. And I, I discovered that many years ago and I think that's also a, a innovation of the future, the, the ability to move large files across time zones and actually collapse time. Okay. We have seen this wonderful project in the university, National University of Bogota here. And I, I was thinking, what do you need? Or, 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 or why uh, they are not begin the, the project in the university? What do you need to, to impulse that the project is done? The working drawings are finished. So what, all we need to do is have the, the, the rector or the president put it up on the front of the funding list. And that's why I say I would like to talk to someone or meet with someone and explain why I think this would be an important example because the building 
by its nature, by its low nature, by the fact that all the classrooms are ac accessed from the outside and all the corridors are open air, and we can modify the auditorium with very little effort, we could make this an exemplary post-COVID project. You know, one of the things that we're going to need coming out of this COVID epidemic is, a, is, is projects to build, to put people back to work. Mm -hmm. And I think they should be exemplary cultural projects. So I would propose that, that perhaps the government would fund this uh, together with Constructionis Planificatis. <laughs> and it could be an example of, of what you can do for a university. I think it's very interesting because it's not a good idea to build 10-story university buildings and have the students have to crowd into an elevator to access the, the classrooms. Uh, it, you know, I think campus design and university design might change a little bit because of the nature of what we're globally experiencing. And, the, and then this building just happens to be perfectly, perfectly suited and designed to address these problems. Okay, I, I, am, I agree. I agree with you. Um, in your experience working in South America, what is the difference working in South America uh, versus working in China or in the U.S.? I've worked in so many different cultures. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, working. I'm working now in the Czech Republic. We're doing a concert hall in Ostrava. And, you know, uh, it's like not very far from where Franz Kafka was born. So you have to worry very hard about the, the, the very strange things that can happen. Um, I, I don't feel, the, the, I, I feel, like I said, the, the passion that I feel is really also about this campus, about the, about the role they're plan and the uniqueness of this campus and the meaning that this building has, especially for the campus and to, let's say, restate the quality and the architectural inspiration of the original campus in a new building. And I, I think that's why it would be very important. I'm, I'm not looking to build a lot of buildings in South America, not at all. I, ha I just, I wanna do quality individual works of architecture. And uh, I mean, I'm not trying to, I don't want a bigger office either. I mean, 40 people, there's too many already. That's enough, right? I mean, I, I think that each work of architecture takes attention uh, and, and it takes the detail attention and, and it takes attention when it's under construction. And I'm very happy to say that we have enough work. We're, we're very strong, but maybe, maybe the reason is that we don't have too many works and most, all, almost all of our work is cultural and university, no, no commercial work. Okay. Stephen, what do you see when you come to Colombia and you know some architects in, uh, of Colombia, uh, what do you see in the architecture of Colombia? How well, you feel? Well, I think the best architect working is John, 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 John Mazzante, who just gave the introduction. I hope he's still there. I love his buildings, and I think they're socially active and they're inventive. And uh, I was on his jury, and he cited in Colo at, at our school, and he cited yeah. his students in Barranquilla. Colombia. That was where the site of his uh, uh, studio, and I was wondering why. And then I discovered that he was born there, so I think that was a good reason. <laughs> yes, I remember when I was there, I got a beautiful tour of Salmonas buildings, the Les Torres de Park, Bull yes. Ring, and uh, some academic, some campus buildings that he did. I, what I loved there is the detail, uh, the, the the sort of attention to detail and the carefulness of just how you move through the buildings. Um, it's a real, you could feel the passion of that, that architect. And uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very important place. And uh, I would love to realize this building. And I want to go back to Montserrat, that go up that, that funicular, funicular. And a nice glass of wine and toast the groundbreaking of our building. You're welcome. The, when, when we finish this pandemic, you're welcome here and we can uh, do a tour of uh, architecture if you want. Uh, 
Stephen, what is the what should be the role of the architect in that society? I think the the chance of the architect uh, even being involved deeply in the programs for the society, you know, the ch the chance that the architect should be uh, not just being a, a a a obedient person in some team, but be there in the beginning in the planning in the in the in the integration of landscape i think today more important than ever is to integrate landscape and architecture so the natural environment is part of what we preserve and construct and uh I, you know i worked as a landscape architect for four years at lawrence halpins in san francisco so every time i start a project i think about the landscape about the environment about ecological issues and therefore, I think that the architect should be in the forefront right from the beginning when, when, when certain uh, ideas are on the table. And they shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't be completely uh, sealed off to other programmatic ideas, other ecological ideas, until an architect uh, can bring a more general approach. Today, I think one of the problems is a specialization of everyone. Too much specialization where an architect should be a generalist, being able to bring in all these issues and not just one or two issues right from the beginning. That's, that's true. What is the experience to teach in the university and teach interior of your studio? Well, I've always been a teacher and uh, I continue to teach online by Zoom. We had to finish our classes on Zoom, but luckily, when we, you know, we started our, our program this year, we met all the students. I think that's very important. We were in the classroom for something like six weeks, and uh, then we had to go out on Zoom. But I think teaching for me is always a way of arguing about what, what's important in our time and our society and uh, giving back something to future generations. So I, I think I will always teach. Okay, one question that people are sending us. We can see that you have a very minimalist use of materials. What can you tell us about your relation with architectural materials? I think the, the I, I believe that buildings should last a hundred years. I don't believe in throwaway buildings. And I believe in the kind of, let's say the old Japanese concept of wabi-sabi. Wabi-sabi is that something could look better many years after it was built. And I'm, I'm very proud to say that buildings that I built over 20 years ago look great today, like the Chapel of St. Ignatius in Seattle. People, if you, if you go to Seattle, you can visit. And the building is 22 years old, and it looks terrific because it was designed to weather and age. So the material has a patina that has the possibility to look really good over time. And what I, I mean, I was educated in Rome. I, as a student, I went and lived in Rome. And what I loved about that city is these older buildings just give this quality of, of time to, to the city. And so good light and good space, but I think the materiality has to be something that has a longer and more gracious span. Okay, another question that they said, what would you say in the main different design in different countries, designing in different countries? What is your drive? How do you take the culture, the culture into consideration? I think I, I've designed some things in Japan uh, based on, on hinged space and void space that would only would only be done in Japan. My Fukuoka housing project, which is still there after 26 years, and it looks good, but it's based on Japanese room sizes and Japanese space, and I would never do that somewhere else. Um, I think the 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 work I did in Helsinki for the Kiyasma Museum was very much about this this site and the circumstance and the relation to Oliver Alto's work and the re relation to this site. So, you know, I, I, I wrote a book, Anchoring, which by the way, I don't know if you can see this, if you can, this new book 
compression uh, just came out and it has the doctorate building in there right after the Kennedy Center. And, uh, and it's on the cover is the, the Queen's Library. But when I first wrote a book about what architecture should be, it was anchoring. And that's five volumes before this. And it's all still available from Princeton Architecture Press. And there I, I made my manifesto and I said, every building should be, first of all, about its site, its circumstance, its culture, its climate, its program. And therefore, not to do a, a signature style and move it from one site to the next. So, you know, hopefully that, that, that kind of a manifesto means that, that you, you know, you have a kind of deeper connection to site and circumstance and locale and culture. Okay. Another question, Stephen, that they send us, do you think of the idea of the start architect negative affect architects students? Yes, I think that's a very unfortunate uh, concoction. Maybe it has to do with uh, Facebook or, uh, you know, I mean, whatever. I mean, I think it's, you know, to make a quality building is something that takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, and it must be experienced in person. I'm not against some of the works that, that fall in that category of so-called star architect, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous term in the sense that it has a cynicism in it. Would we, would we call Palladio a star architect? I guess he was. I think it's just a, a quality architecture is, is, a, is a great effort. And I think of someone like Pierre Chirot who did the Maison de Verre in Paris. Fantastic, amazing, intense, one of the most intense interior spaces, very little of an exterior, but one of the most intense interior spaces ever been conceived in the 20th century. And then maybe he only did two or three works, but maybe you would say he was a star architect. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's just a, a, it's not, I think students should visit buildings and make their own opinion about them. And, Don't trust images on the internet. Okay. There's two last questions, Stephen. We know your time is very uh, precious and, 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 and we are very happy to have you here uh, today. Uh, they say, what, what's your advice for your young architect's interest in phenom phenomenology and spatial experience today? Spatial experience today. Well, I think being able to study their designs uh, uh, when, they're, when they're making something, study them in natural light with models. You know, what, one of the things that we did here, we have a, a, an internship every summer. We have and five students and they work and they work in paper models just shaping space and light so light space and shadow become key ingredients a, a focus of whatever their ideas would be and likewise i think you know when you go and visit something you see you you sense the space and light and phenomena like let's for example The Pantheon, which I visited maybe 10 times in my life, or maybe 15 times. I remember when I first went there as a student, and I was shocked at how different that that space, that enormous space with that 30-foot oculus of light coming in, how different it can be in every day. So you, can't, you cannot photograph that. You can't even make a video of it. You know, when the rain comes down, and you see the sparkling light on the raindrops and it hits that big marble floor and you see the cuts that the Romans made for the drains that amazingly drained the center. You know, you realize this building is so engaged with its, its environment, with its light, with the weather, with the sunlight, with the seasons, with time. So you must, uh, as a student, you must go those to those places and see them at different times of the season and different times of the day. And to me, that's the phenomenological essence of architecture. And today, I think we need it more than ever because everything is so flattened out by digital communication. You know, it's a, that's a kind of, uh, uh, yeah, anyway. Okay. 
And last question, because uh, we are running time uh, from your experience, what can you tell us about running an architecture office? I'm a terrible businessman, so I, I <laughs> don't follow my lead because I, lo I lose so much money and I, I don't know exactly how we survive. So, uh, I mean, I never give up on a project that we ran out of. The worst, the worst are these competitions. They drain you. You get so excited about the design and you just, they drain all your resources. So be careful with competitions because the juries, you know, sometimes are not fair. And I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I remember a joke of Johnny Carson. He, he, he was divorced like five times in his life, the comedian, you know, Johnny Carson. Yes. And someone yes. asked him, can you give us any advice about marriage? And he said, well, it'd be like asking the, the captain of the Titanic about navigation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Stephen, it's a wonderful uh, conversation we have today. Uh, thank you very much for your time to having you here. We hope having you here in Bogota and in Colombia soon uh, after this pandemic so we can uh, talk in face to face and probably we can visit some of the project that Construcción Planifica has done and, and the different architects that we have actually here in Colombia and we hope the best for you for your family and Stephen whole team uh, thank you very much for uh, having this uh, conversation today uh, and we will hope to see uh, soon this project in the university, National University here. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, take your voice uh, to the different uh, people that have to be, uh, so we can look for this project soon. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. A todos los seguidores, muchas gracias eh, por su tiempo estar hoy eh, con Steve, eh, Stephen Hall. Y les recordamos que el día de mañana, a las 10 de la noche, tendremos al ingeniero acústico John Soler de la firma Sound Arts eh, de Estados Unidos en Arquitectura 2020. Nos mostrará parte de sus experiencias en los más importantes teatros desarrollados alrededor de todo el mundo. Les recordamos que todos los conversatorios, incluido este conversatorio, están en la página de www.wradio.com.co slash arquitectur y en la página de www.construccionesplanificadas.com slash arquitectur. Muchas gracias a Construcciones Planificadas, muchas gracias a la W Radio y al Grupo Abad por hacer posible este evento y este conversatorio tan agradable que tuvimos el día de hoy. Feliz semana y nos vemos el día de mañana a las 10 am. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego.